call the meeting to order. This is the meeting of the Landmarks and Historic Districts Board uh, for its annual celebration of the Vernal Equinox on March 19, 2024. Uh, <coughs> we have uh, present uh, Landmarks and Historic District Board members, uh, Stephanie Green, Bill Hine, Barbara Roberts, Jeff Givens, Susan Clark, Tim Gennettis, and Vicki Kahn, and myself, Ed Wisnofsky, and uh, on Zoom, I'm not sure if she is present at the moment, but uh, uh, at the moment absent is uh, Martha Green. This meeting is being conducted under town and New York State law that provides for in-person and uh, remote participation. Individuals may undertake uh, participation by uh, clicking on the uh, Zoom link to be found on the published agenda of the Landmarks Board and on the town clerk's portal. Uh, for those who just wish to view uh, one may do so by uh, clicking the live button at the top of the town clerk's meeting portal. Uh, <coughs> for remote comment and in-person comment, uh, individuals uh, will be asked to provide their uh, name and their uh, hamlet or village of residence uh, at the time they make comments. Uh, they may make comments uh, remotely by raising your hand or uh, providing uh, information in the chat uh, so that the moderator, Kevin of CTV, uh, may provide access to you. To reduce wait times for online and in-person uh, participants, our practices to advance such items on our meeting agenda. Uh, for those who may be present or uh, online. Uh, with that, uh, I think we can proceed to the business uh, of our meeting. Uh, the first item on the agenda would be the approval of the minutes that have been distributed by Stephanie. And uh, were there some tweaks to there be made? There were some revisions that were made uh, based on uh, comments Just with a Susan. couple clarifications. And I okay. think you, oh, okay. you okay. also chimed in on one. It could have been my presentation that needed the clarification, <laughs> but it was correct yeah. in the minutes. Now. Okay. Right, and they were the minutes were revised and recirculated. Yeah. Right. Uh, so with that, uh, it, there is a motion from Vicki to approve, seconded by Susan. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, and the minutes are approved. And Ed, Martha has joined us. We should say she's present. Oh. Ah. Hey. Greetings, Martha. You are now present. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Thank you. So sorry. Right. Uh, okay, so we will proceed with uh, the agenda uh, items of interest to uh, uh, those who are here. Uh, the first one that uh, we have is uh, 361 Mitchell Lane, which is an application uh, for demolition. And uh, for uh, that, let me just provide, if you want a chance to speak, at, uh, let me set things up and before you speak and uh, uh, allow me to provide some background for um, for individuals here. Um, This is a, um, an old farm uh, based house that once uh, had a lot more buildings on it than it does uh, have now. Uh, the <coughs> uh, farm basically was uh, for many years farmed by a uh, farmer named Charles Rayner and uh, 
that uh, basically his farm operation probably ended when he died in 1940 or so. His widow lived uh, on the f farm there for an, a number of years as well. Um, the house and the buildings, just to provide some uh, reference for you here. Um, let me go to <clears throat> Uh, the, the, what's there on the property at the moment is uh, the house and two outbuildings. Uh, this is uh, one of the outbuildings uh, that are located in fairly uh, rundown condition. Uh, these are pictures of the house as it uh, exists now. Uh, the front porch is propped up with uh, uh, a, a kind of a post of uh, wood. I don't think it's locust wood, but uh, uh, because they're rotting at the base uh, on the porch elements there. Uh, as you can see, the windows in the house and, and doors have been redone. They're not authentic in any uh, way. Um, the Trees and um, foliage, some of marked obviously for clearance when a demolition uh, might take place. Um, uh, the porch you can see here is uh, actually not well, uh, well supported uh, at the moment uh, either. Uh, the foundation uh, is looks like about 1910 type of construction material. The back porch is covered by uh, juniper uh, of uh, large character. This is the second uh, in this interior of the second outbuilding uh, that was there. Uh, not quite sure what the uh, purpose of that bench or staging was with the stairs there inside this building. It has a concrete floor. Uh, uh, this is, again, uh, plant life that has uh, <laughs> gone uncared for for a while and is uh, obscuring the, uh, uh, obscuring the uh, building there. You can see this juniper, which is basically about ready to take over the back of the house. Uh, uh, the juniper is in the best shape. The house is in the worst shape uh, there. Uh, again, this is uh, to the south, looking on the south side uh, through the driveway uh, between the uh, two buildings there. Uh, stairway to the back porch. Uh, this is a, what was a, a rear entrance uh, to the house uh, as well. So that's the four sides of the house. This is the interior of uh, the first uh, outbuilding that I uh, showed you uh, in the pictures. Uh, that's uh, the front side of it as well. Uh, it too had a concrete floor uh, there. Uh, the farmer bought this house in 1907 from uh, another local farmer named Nathaniel Hand. The Hands, actually Mitchell's Lane at one time was called Hands Lane, uh, and uh, uh, Nathaniel Hand farmed on the east side. His father, Orlando Han, farmed on the west side with big tracts of uh, farmland. And we actually reviewed Orlando's hand house across the street about three or four, about four years ago uh, for remodeling. They preserved the house uh, and did some uh, uh, 
interior work on the house that uh, kept it as uh, at least a remnant of a once famous uh, Birchamptonite uh, in the community. Um, <clears throat> to just uh, also provide, see if I can provide the... Um, reference here for this is the 1916 map um, where you can see uh, Charles Rayner and this would have been uh, the buildings that we are talking about uh, today so uh, in any case, would you like to provide some comments about? You pretty much said what I wanted to say. You know the history very well. My name is Mayron Talai. We're the architects for the uh, current owner, 361 ML LLC. I personally looked at the house. I did not go inside the house or the garage, but in our opinion, my opinion, there's there's no. First of all, both structures or three structures need major structural um, remedies. Uh, they need to be uh, fixed, and they're not worth fixing. Uh, we concluded that there's no architectural significance to any of these buildings, so they could be easily demolished. If not, they're not demolished now, eventually they're going to be tear torn down by nature. They're, they're in bad shape. Mm. And I have a letter supporting that. <coughs> Uh, just to l let me also pr try to uh, bring up one other element here that has maybe some significance eventually for um, <coughs> uh, for us. This is the property in 1984. Um, if I go back to 1976, uh, you can see that there are more buildings uh, on the property. Uh, 1984, We see some building going on. A subdivision took place in 1976, and eventually some of the uh, subdivided lots were sold. But this property has uh, a barn on it. Uh. And the barn was moved from 361. Right. Uh, and I did, the, the reason I call attention to it. I've had two conversations uh, with uh, a nonprofit that is interested in seeing it preserved uh, at some point. Uh, whether it happens or not is another question, but uh, they uh, have an interest in seeing that uh, it remains uh, as a remnant rather than disappear with uh, McMansion-style building. Uh, there has been a lot of building going on on Mitchell Lane of uh, uh, rather large houses, and uh, that uh, does offend certain sensibilities in the community. So, so but in any case... Uh, that's, that's it, sir. Uh, just like John said, up to... In in my opinion, we only looked at it for structural, uh, for architectural value, mm -hmm. and we found nothing. So, we're requesting a permission from the board to award us a demolition permit. And um, I wanted to mention I did find it the AKRF in the list in back. It's on page 18 T 94. However, the comment was that they couldn't assess it because it wasn't visible. Mm -hmm. So there was no, they couldn't <coughs> say one way or the other what wow. their opinion was mm -hmm. of it. I mean, my recommendation would be not to object to mm -hmm. uh, the application and uh, um, respond to the building department with that. 
is that acceptable? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. That, that's it. I'd like to just still submit this letter if possible to the board members. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We looked at it, no architectural value. Whatever, whatever. Okay, well, we'll attach it to uh, the record. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So we make a decision tonight, or are we? That, that's the decision, and yeah. you're done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we have. Uh, uh, Thank you. Mike. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Uh, 3058 Noyak Road. Um, so let me bring that up. Uh, this house has a uh, th this is a uh, <coughs> A map, let's see what uh, date of this map. I'm not quite sure, but uh, this house sits close by Trout Pond on Noyak Road, as you can see here. And uh, the records in the town indicate uh, that it was built in 1927, um, which fits because in looking at a the 1930 Suffolk County aerial series, uh, you see the house uh, present there. So uh, that makes, uh, makes sense. Um, I took some pictures of the house. The house had <coughs> The house sits on Noyak Road in a rather dangerous place, by the way. You take your life in your hands trying to get out of the driveway of that property because you cannot, you're blinded from seeing oncoming cars. Uh. Uh, and uh, certainly not a place I would like to, myself to have, uh, to have a resonance. Let's see where we go here. Okay, so this house had a stop work order on it from uh, October. Uh, it's being renovated. Uh, I, the letter calls, uh, refers to it as a restoration, the letter describing the work, but it really is uh, a renovation. Um, and a lot of the, what happened to my pictures here? This is, this is the house. It has a enclosed porch on the one side. They are installing a large uh, picture window. Uh, ins they're insulated windows um, that are taking place. This is an entry uh, on the side of the building it's a very narrow, uh, this is the east facade of the building, very narrow piece of property, 65 feet wide. Uh, so it doesn't meet any of the uh, requirements for setbacks, certainly. Um, I don't have uh, any issues with the, what's being done. The house ha doesn't have any great architectural distinction to it. Uh, no sense of any history associated with a person or any kind of uh, uh, events associated with the development of the Noyak uh, community or communities in Noyak uh, over the period of uh, 
the 120 years that it that that, that has been taking place. So, um, you know, my sense is that uh, um, you know, app, you know, the fact that the work was done without a permit is one of those problems that we were uh, gossiping about uh, before the meeting. And, uh, you know, other than that, I don't see any reason to uh, object to, um, you know, the construction taking place here. Uh, the kind of construction is a matter of taste uh, more than anything else. Uh, I'm not sure I like big picture windows in certain places, but uh, there was a big window originally there that had multi, multi-lighted uh, structure to it uh, as well previously. Uh, I don't know, have any comments uh, for that? Okay. Well, with that, I'll send a response back to the building department. We have no objection to uh, the uh, work that uh, is proposed and uh, is being done other than that it was being done without a permit. Hi, my name is Matthias Toner. I'm the architect for this um, project. And uh, I just want to clarify a couple of things which also irk me. <laughs> um, so, um, the homeowner started to renovate the building without a permit. And then all of a sudden, when it was shut down, uh, that, that homeowner became my client. They found me, they, they interviewed me, hired me, and said, you know, can you, can you fix it? So, uh, and I, to I told them, I can. And so we had to, you know, retroactive create ex uh, previous plans and, and drawings. And then we uh, created a plan set which shows the intent of the renovation <coughs> or uh, alteration of the building. Um, the intent of the of the of the uh, renovation of the building is to keep it intact as much as possible, because I personally I like the building. It has, if I take it a little stretch, I, it it is actually, to me, it has kind of a Scandinavian. Uh, influence, uh, which I personally like, and so, <coughs> and the owner is is also uh, very much on board. To we're not changing any window sizes. We kept all the sizes as there are. We're not changing. We're not coming up with any materials which are not um, consistent with the material language within the neighborhood. And um, I think at the end of the day, it will be a very um, a very appealing building. We're not changing any footprint, and it is a pre-existing non-conforming, which is a totally different story, and it's very complicated to to do things in that building. But um, we are now at a position that we can actually start when we have your approval. We can start finally to do the real work and be and do it do it right. So I just wanted to clarify because I personally. I was very offended when, when they started to do it and without a permit. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to uh, make that clear. I'm glad you spoke about it. <laughs> <laughs> I told the client, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all we I need, We need more people like that. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you. Right. Thank, okay. you. Thank, thank you very thanks. much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we can take up sign business. Um, what is this sign? For 2331 Montauk Highway, uh, <coughs> for example. Thank you. Right, good night. Mm -hmm. okay. And we were
received this referral from the ZBA for, or is it a referral or not? Yes, there was some uh, variant uh, about the height of the sign and some other requests that were associated yes, with it. Request for variant pending in front of the zoning board. Um, <coughs> this is in the Bridgehampton Historic District, uh, a new office building. And uh, let's see if we have um, the sign. It's actually kind of two signs, a V uh, sign, so that it has two faces to it in two directions that's being proposed. Um, and these design elements were forwarded to you in uh, the application or the materials that were uploaded to the Landmarks portal. Um, yeah, here's, here's the memo that says, at the request of the applicant, please review the materials here, so using that language, providing any recommendations. Um, the, some of the features of the sign, um, they're asking for a variance of uh, height from, I think, uh, a limit of six foot, but when it elevated seven foot, and that's because there is a kind of like a swale or a depression off of this, the Main Street Montauk Highway down to the grade level of the building, so that the sign would look more, uh, it would be blocked in some ways. Uh, with that elevation. Um, I took some pictures here. Let me see if I can find them again. Okay. Actually, I took these pictures after last February's meeting at night after the <laughs> we got through with our meeting. Uh, this, this is a sign that is located in the building next door to its west, uh, it's a house that has an antique store in it. And if you remember that there is another aspect uh, uh, to this. Yeah. That's not the lot that we're talking about. No, I know that. I'm going through the sequence of uh, the lots. So this is the next, two, it's two lots down. Um, this is the lot 
Next going east on Montauk Highway, this is the south side of the highway. Uh, this, is, this is somewhat like the sign that, uh, or the style of the sign has some backlighting for the letters. Can I, yeah, I yeah. Here, you want me to? yeah. Yeah, you can. Thank you. Good evening, I'm David Gilmore, and I'm from the law firm Greenberg Troy. Good. Benefits from that sign. <laughs> Uh, so we're obviously the neighbor and, and we represent the property next door. And the sign that you see there for my firm is exactly what the Farrell sign will look like, except it'll say Farrell and it'll be blue. Um, the Farrell sign had been at that location. We rented the building uh, when Farrell moved next door. and. Um, so it, it'll be the exact same sign that had been there, which I have photographs of. So this is the building in which the sign would be installed in front of. So um, this would be a third sign. Uh, yes, yes, I was going to say, are any of those <laughs> signs coming down? Yeah, one, one is proposed to be removed. Which, which one? I believe the one that that faces west, the, the so higher the one. The higher one, yeah. Um, so it uh, it basically would be. I don't, this is kind of looking at the front of the building. Um, so you have the facade with the Farrell sign on it facing out. And then you would have this V-shaped sign with Farrell uh, offices showing east and west in front of the building. Right. Uh, and did did you say you had pictures of? Uh, I do. Yeah. Uh, This was what our submission to the Zoning Board of Appeals was. Um, you can see the, the first picture is of the Farrell sign at, at our building, right? So, so this was replaced by the Greenberg Troward sign. Uh, the second sign, uh, second, I'm sorry, second photograph shows the Greenberg Troward sign, which you've now seen in all of its glory. Um, the, the next picture, you're, you're facing east on the sidewalk, looking into the area where the sign's going to be located. And I did that for the zoning board to demonstrate, um, you know, the area where it's going to go and the challenges, um, one of which is the fence, the other of which Mr. Wisnowski described as a depression. So it goes down. I have a picture further on that shows... Um, the height. Um, this is a picture a little bit further east, unobstructed of the area it's going into. Um, and again, another one a little bit further east of that. Um, and these, these all show that there's, there, we, you know, we need a little bit of extra height, but there's no impact to anyone, um, which is one of the things that the zoning board looks at. This shot is looking out from the area where the sign's going to be, and you can see that there's a, it's about a three foot retaining wall on top of which there's a fence. So um, that's the height and location of what we were looking at. I then took photographs of all the signs on Montauk Highway um, and went through the area. So this is, this is the property directly to our west. Um, then here you see the Saunders sign, which is uh, both sides. Um, there's a construction company sign, um, and then the, the sign at the church. 
My favorite one <laughs> was the one that's um, set in the town right of way here, which uh, welcomes you to historic Bridgehampton. Um, some of the things, you know, we're talking about setbacks <coughs> of the sign with the zoning board, so that was pretty appropriate to show that there's one in the uh, town right of way to show that we're consistent. Um, the next one's the Bridgehampton Inn, and again, I'm taking these from the sidewalk, so they were all really close, and if you're familiar with that area, the signs are, are almost on the road. Um, this Build Lab sign is huge, yeah. <laughs> and it is, it is almost on the street. Um, the Newman Village sign is, is set back somewhat more, and then you have the Queen of the Most Holy Rosary sign, which is you know, pretty and, and appropriate um, for Champion Museum sign. And then um, sign in front of the Bridgehampton Community House, which if you're familiar that is has got to be two or three feet off the sidewalk, I think still in the town right of way, and it contains advertising. Uh, there's another sign, I'm, you know, I don't know if there's a permit for it, and prefer not to comment on that, but that's also on the Bridgehampton uh, Community Center. Um, so we appeared in front of the, the zoning board, uh, presented this and, and our arguments, and um, they said it's in the historic district. We should come here and talk to you. I understand we have to come back for a certificate of appropriateness. So, you know, I think subject to, to David and Ed that you would just comment on whether you think it's appropriate for a variance to be uh, given in this particular case. Um, I think our, our you know, I think we demonstrate that at least for the setback that um, we meet the character of the area. There's far, far more signs, far more forward, um, and I think we've provided to the zoning board that there are compelling reasons why we need it. Signs are safety uh, devices that announce uh, property in a business so you know when to make the turn. Um, in this particular case, um, the planning board during the site plan process did not allow that property to have access from Montauk Highway. So both the Greenberg Troar and the Farrell Building take access from, um, from one spot which is a little bit uh, west of the Greenberg sign. So it's a I mean, the, the, and the parking is, is, I don't want to say share, because there's a lease that identifies our spots, but um, there is, uh, there is shared, a shared parking lot that uh, the Farrell employees come through. Um, but it, it was a, you know, I believe a well thought out placement of it, because it sort of bookends the Greenberg Trorig sign. Tried to get some distance from it, so you're not seeing a whole bunch of signs as you, uh, as you pull down the street. I also provided you with a, with a photograph, um, and I think Ed had done one as well, that shows the, um, the backlighting of it, of the sign, um, of our sign, which is, is what the one that Farrell will look like, it was taken at dusk before the zoning board meeting. And it's, and it's tasteful and, and it you know, just highlights the, um, highlights the name on the sign. Um, there was no proper no uh, no problem when we did it with the with the original Farrell sign. Um, the original Farrell sign also got relief from the zoning board for the things that we're asking uh, for now for the current Farrell sign. A couple Questions. of questions. Sure. Um, so one of the variances that is being asked for is for to allow the sign to be a total of forty five point eight square feet or a maximum of 32 square feet is permitted. How is that area measured? Does that include also the base of the sign, or does that just include the sign I think it just includes itself? the signage, but. Because that's a 43% increase that you're asking for in the size of the sign relative to what's permitted. Right. Um, that seems like a lot. Well, I, I would say, um, I, you know, it's, it's hard to be in front of this board and argue the zoning case, which is, what I appear to be here for. I, 
um, understand that there's a certificate of appropriateness that we have to come get, which I would have thought came later in the process. Right. But, but here we are. Um, what I would say to you is when um, there, you, you bring up two parts of the variance test. New York State has a um, balancing test of benefit to the applicant against the detriment to the health, sa health safety, and welfare of the neighborhood or community. Within that, they provide five prongs. Your question involves two of them. <laughs> First of all is the character of the neighborhood. I provided you with the pictures, and that's why I did it to the zoning board, which shows you the character of the neighborhood, which is huge signs, not far set back, right? And I think we, we far exceed that. The other part is substantiality, right? Mm -hmm. And when the zoning board considers substantiality, they have to do that um, within the context of the circumstances, right? Which I think also leads us back to one is that it's within the character of the community, right? There are large signs there, so why should this property not get a large sign when others have them? Uh, the, the second thing that I think we look at is the physical setup of the property. So as you can see that this, this sign is Set, it's set back 16 and a half feet, mm -hmm. and it's got you know some some uh, you know fence or railing issues, right? You have to, with with the size of the uh, retaining wall, you had to put a fence there because somebody could fall over it. So, between those two things, we needed something that would more capture, um, more capture you know a driver's attention and for safety. And and frankly, th this sign. You know, this sign exists, right? I, you know, I think it's being housed somewhere. So, you know, there is uh, some benefit to us that we don't have to go out and do a new sign. Um, but it's, it is the sign that's been at the Farrell Building since that building was built in CO. Mm -hmm. okay. So, in the pictures, do we know if the signs that you've shown, if they have a certificate of compliance? Or were they given any variances? I didn't. I, I didn't look at that. Um, it's uh, contrary to my nature to get other people in trouble, <laughs> right? So I didn't. I knew I'd be asked that question, and I wanted to have this answer handy. That um, you know, I didn't. I didn't. Don't want to be that person. That's fair. Do we have any idea at what time of the night the uh, illumination will be turned off? I believe off? they turn off at eleven automatically. And I think that's a, a <coughs> code requirement. Code in that area. Or it, it actually, maybe sooner. I may have said 11. It was a mistake, and it was 10. But I can get, I can form you on that. Excuse me, sir. So the existing sign, it was illuminated? Yes. And so how many illuminated signs are going to be on this building? There, there will be one on the building, and then, you know, there will be a freestanding sign and one on the building. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Does the I, application I include removal of that yes. existing sign? I'm not understanding maybe the purpose of the illumination if it's not used at night. I mean, most people, I have not driven through Bridgehampton in the after dark for a while, so I'll leave that to be addressed by you know the, the Bridgehampton There's group. But I mean, when I go to Bridgehampton, I know where I'm going, and at nighttime. I don't, would anybody be accessing, I think the building's closed at that time, so I don't understand. Well, at, at what time? After, after dark. Well, it, you know, it depends when dark descends on us, right? We just had the, the change in clocks, but at I, 4 o'clock it gets dark. Right. I, Most of those signs that were mentioned aren't illuminated. And there isn't an entrance where you're thinking of putting the sign. But you said that it's a matter of safety. But if there's no entrance, wouldn't that be quite the opposite? Well, no, it, it would highlight the fact that that's where the building is, and then they'd look for the entrance. I mean, I think it, it makes it more so that you need the sign that, that people would see it. I, I would have to study more, you know, the town code even with um, it, it appears to be a neon sign, and I know it's not. It's the backlight, but and the backlighting is subtle. For intention purposes, it appears. The backlighting has existed on the Farrell sign. I think that building's been there. 
How, how long? 15 years? So and, then, and then it exists on the Greenberg Traurig sign, and, and that has been there for two years. I Do I understand you correctly in saying that this sign already exists? And, well, or you're making a bigger version of what existed? No, no. So, so th there are two buildings. We'll call them sister buildings, right? The one to the west was the original Farrell building, right? Right. Mm -hmm. That had the Farrell sign, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Greenberg Traurig rented it, and Greenberg Traurig put its sign on it. Farrell moved next door. Yeah, and needs to have a sign. Wants to have a freestanding sign. The Greenberg Traurig sign is new, right? It's new in the fact that it's not Farrell, and it's physically new. It and also doesn't look like it's shaped like the Farrell sign. It's, sign, it's exact, it's, uh, exactly the same. It's shaped like a wedge. Yes, so you can see it from either side. Okay. So was there a variant granted? For yes. that sign? Yes. There was. There was, yeah. And, and about the same distance back. This, this picture was taken at 8.45 in the evening from the information associated with the image. So I don't know how long the lights stay on. I think didn't you say They're on until at least 10 o'clock because I've mm -hmm. driven back from Montauk and seen them all on. So this sign here no longer exists in any manner or form. It, it exists now it's with Greenberg Traurig. It's not installed, but this is this is the sign that's going to be. That that's the one that will be reinstalled. Yeah. Was this one backlit? Yes. The original. Exactly fabric? the same. Yeah. It's in the book. Yeah. 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 I don't remember it being backlit. One of the things that would be of concern to me with a certificate of appropriateness is the increasing appearance of a commercial strip and feel for the main street of Bridgehampton. And uh, signage and how the signs appear and their size, you know, uh, add to the idea that maybe they're not only identifying the place, but they're advertising for the parties that have the signs. And uh, so size to me is important as well as uh, even how much they would be illuminated so at night uh, for a length of time uh, because I think it diminishes the historic character of the Bridgehampton Hamlet uh, down the road. But that's a discussion we can have for another time, but I just, you know, I just want to give you some of my uh, I, thoughts. I would respond in two ways. One, it is a commercial strip. Let there be no doubt, right? You saw all the signs. It is a commercial strip. Um, and, and secondly, and, and I said this before, that you know, there's a safety feature to this, to, you know, to identify the business and its location. Well, I, I understand that... I mean, that I see the name Farrell 7,000 yeah. times a day. I it, don't... Well, uh, I don't have anything to do with the, with the other yeah, Farrell I mean, signs. I know what you're I'm saying, here on but this it's sign, just like but, safety. And to, but it's unfair to say that there are other signs that would impact this application, right? We're here for this, and this only. So um, how much different than this one is this new sign? There's no difference. No difference whatsoever? No difference. It's the same sign. Height and everything is the same. Correct. It's, why does it say something different on it, then? It says Farrell Companies as opposed to Farrell Building. I don't know, maybe, maybe they changed it, but I think it's physically the same sign. Um, this is the one they gave me. I needed an example of what it looked like when it was on the Farrell site, the original Farrell site. Right. It, it does appear that they're going to be remaking it somehow because it's... Mm, they could be remaking the front of it or the face of it. Yeah. But this is the one that they presented to me as the one that had existed there. And then you said the background was black instead of blue. No, it's blue. Oh, it is blue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Greenberg Traurig sign, I think the back is black. Yeah, okay. It doesn't have this, it does have the oh, trim okay. on it. Yeah. yeah, all right. I guess my, you know, my overall impression here, looking at all of these examples, most of these examples are 
uh, signs that are you know basically painted. They look like they're wood or something like that. Um, and a number of them have a more historic appearance. Again, we're considering this from the standpoint of a recently established historic district. Um, this, this kind of sign, it's, its construction, its materials, its backlighting um, is not, in my opinion, um, consistent with the historic appearance of this commercial area. But, um, but I, I think, with all due respect, I understand, mm -hmm. but, but doesn't the sign have to match the building, which is a year old, two years old? Uh, you know, it, it's really unfair. I'm trying to present an argument, and to have you roll your eyes at me is really unfair. I think I deserve more respect than that. I think, sir, we are being respectful. We're simply asking I'm, questions. I'm sorry, but another I, member... I, I object to that. Another I, I, member, I not you, just rolled their eyes at me as I'm trying to, to present my case. And that's unfair. So with there. respect to um, the questions of the variants, with respect to, you have, uh, that's what, oh, Martha, did you have something to? Well, I wanted to pick up on Stephanie's point because I think it's relevant. I know all of those signs. This is my town. And I don't find the blue color particularly historic or muted. I think it's far brighter. I remember the federal sign. Um, it's it's not an argument to say that we see the name too often. That's not my business. But it doesn't have the character of the historic district. I can't tell the man to change his typeface. That's his logo. He's built it up over many years. But uh, I think I I I think this whole thing of lighting the signs backlit is a very modern feel and not in keeping. And I know you're presenting an argument, but I don't personally agree with your argument. And I want to pay you the respect of having listened to it and know the town really well. So that's all I have to say. Okay, again, my point. I would say before I could, um, I mean, before it comes up for CO, I will make a point to be out at night driving uh, through East Hampton and through Sag Harbor to see what type of signs. What? You wouldn't find a sign like that <laughs> near Sag Harbor, even on the gateway coming in. Because, Sag you know, Harbor. my impression the last time I did drive through Bridgehampton at night, it's just when the lights start bouncing, you feel like you're going through a corridor, they start bouncing back and forth, and I find that yeah. dis distracting at best. I yeah, and just to add, to add to a that. point, yeah, I, I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe the village of Southampton does not allow backlit lighting That's correct. in their signs. So I'm just telling you, you know, they're going for a historic character too, but they're a so village. Right, so I would look at those, versus a town. the towns with the historic it's districts. Just, and, right? yeah. and I mean, the, again, you know, it, we can argue about you know, the subtlety of it. Um, I don't have a picture of the, of the Farrell sign. I can show you the subtlety. The greenberg Troyd sign, that was taken uh, mid-afternoon during the winter. You can see the snow on the ground uh, from it. But, um, you know, I see the sign all the time. It's a pretty subtle sign. And this, again, you, you're 16 and a half feet set back from the street, right? It's, I, I think, more so than any of the other signs that you see here, this is this is the most set back. The, the church is set back more, and I think Newman Village is set back more. Others are, are much further forward, and frankly, bigger. I know in some um, historic districts, even um, black you know black buildings are an issue, gold lettering's an issue, and I realize. We're going to need to formulate more of that, that yeah, if gold, gold is an issue, you know, we've got a lot of gold there mm -hmm. that so, I so would have to study more before I could right. issue So uh, just with respect to the question of responding to 
the ZBA, we have no specific opinion on any of the questions except maybe the size of the sign? Well, there's also mm. one of the um, variances that's being uh, requested here is the set to allow the sign to be internally illuminated in a Hamlet office district, where internally illuminated signs are only allowed in the highway business zoning district. So the that's internal illumination is something that uh, a variance is being requested okay, for Okay, so yeah. that would Absolutely. be uh, also a question to raise as uh, something um, of concern to us. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, look, looking at the number of examples here in the in the booklet, it looks like two of the examples are backlit signs, uh, somewhat similar to this, and then the other eleven examples are all painted signs. Correct. I can't really see if any of them have external illumination on them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Flood, flood light. Some ground right. ground yeah. flood lighting. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure some of them do, but just you know, again. This seems to add, at least from what I see here, another internally illuminated sign in an area where those kinds of signs are not prevalent. And where, again, we have a recently established historic district. Right. I mean, just looking at the kinds of materials that the sign is made out of, it's, you know, it's metal, it's, it's not, it's a more modern sign to my eyes than what I would expect in a historic district. Mm -hmm. so that's well, I, I would just offer one comment that mm -hmm. may shift you know, the, the idea a little bit, and that is you have modern architectural buildings that have been installed, probably regretfully for some of us, uh, on the main street of uh, Bridgehampton. Uh, and the compatibility or the connection of style and contemporaneous character, you know, does have an argument, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, yes. would, I would agree uh, so, with that, yeah. yeah. But I, I, I am concerned about the illumination issue and the kind of size issue yeah. that's uh, involved uh, with the signage. And with respect to my opinion, as time goes on, we had a discussion about signage at our last meeting. Uh, and uh, the question was uh, whether or not Bridgehampton had sign malpractice as a way of life uh, because of some of the things we were looking at there. So th this is a point at which there will be a number of crossing uh, issues and feelings on things. I mean, that's, that's a fair statement. I, I was around um, when Dennis Susskind, and he was the leader of the group that changed the signage and, and uh, put in a full and robust sign law. Um, so, you know, I get it. I don't know how many of these pre-existed. And, and again, I don't want to be the person that uh, turns somebody in for it. Another observation, and I'll have to take a look, but uh, when I went through these pictures just quickly now, some of these are uplit, which is mm -hmm. far less subtle than the backlit yeah. that we're asking for. And, and I'll look at it, but you know, I think the idea is, is to prefer, you know, prefer more, how do I say this? Quiet. Yeah, classy <laughs> you know, view of it by backlighting it instead of uplighting it. Right, I think yeah. that's. Is it the feral blue? Yes, uh, yes, it's the feral blue. And it, you know, obviously. Not a historic color. Yeah, I, again, I mean, there's there's a there's a feral sign on the building. Both of them are legal. I believe this matches it. One of those will be removed as part of this process. Um, okay. I think I think there's a consistency that you need for a. You know, it's a more classic look, I, I would say, to, to change it in some way, I think, um, ruins that consistency. So I think at least we have the, the comment response to the ZBA, mm -hmm. and you know, then it's up to them to do what they want to do, and when you're ready right. to apply for a certificate of appropriateness, uh, right. 
at, at, at the, um, I, I don't, I don't want to misquote you, right? So I've got to go to the zoning board Thursday night. I'm going to say there's, they have, uh, this board has an issue with the backlighting and the size of the sign. Mm -hmm. right, those are the other. The I'll other see if I can get the communication into the. Into the Okay. Uh, I just want to be. I don't. I don't want to misquote you in any way, right? So, right. So we're, that's a fair outcome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks for the information too. Yeah. yeah. Hopeful. Okay. Have we um, lost our signal? Pardon. There's no signal up there. Oh, that's because oh, screen, okay. screen saver. Yeah, my okay. machine goes to sleep oh, okay. Thought we had if it gets there. too bored with my conversation. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, that brings us back to the order of the agenda. Uh, 166 Sabonic Road. Uh, we have been there before for an earlier demolition of a house back in, uh, I forget uh, what the, um, what the period of time was. Um, um, August 2023. August, it was so the last accessory year. structure and right, that, at the that yeah. altered, modern looking. So uh, <clears throat> this is it. It sits next to the golf course. And uh, the house itself is in great shape. Um, but it's been remodeled. It's not, you know, something of an original uh, character. Um, looks like it was remodeled and redone relatively recently, given the shingles uh, color. This is uh, the side of the house. This is one of the accessory buildings that would also be demolished um, in the application. Uh, this is the rear of the house. Uh, the south facing facade of the house, <laughs> south <laughs> westerly facing facade, has a cellar with the Bilko doors. Yeah, that's the yard and a swimming pool in back. Well maintained fence and <clears throat> a uh, pr perspective from the corner and the rear entrance and a famous octagonal window. Uh, uh, so uh, that's the house that uh, is there. Uh, dating it is very difficult. Um, I had this is uh, 1916 map here, if I can get Tuckahoe. What you see right here is this is Sabonic Road, uh, and the house that we're talking about here is labeled M. Miller. Uh, Merritt Miller, who uh, his wife was, I forget what his wife's name was, but she was reported as having twins in Tuckahoe uh, in 1902. Uh, this house has an AYB uh, and the assessor's information of 1900. Um, Merritt Miller was a, uh, originally a uh, lifesaver in East Hampton uh, before he moved
moved to Tuckahoe, uh, and I believe he worked on the golf links afterwards as they became uh, established there. Uh, a, a gardener or a, involved with uh, the care of uh, the golf links, both uh, there. Uh, the house is in good shape. You know, it's a shame to see That's something like that, I think. Uh, I guess that was what's striking to me. The one thing, it is on the AK, RF list that that that's a, the little one in the back. Um, not sure what it said. Probably needs to be needs more research. Um, research. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's just it's in such good condition. It's I'm not understanding particularly when they were demoing in the back the one accessory and we had no objection, thinking that this was in good condition. It was going to be saved. Well, this is the era of big houses. And, yeah. uh, well, you can I, even tell am, by the by the way the air conditioning unit looks mm -hmm. brand new. And why is it so far from the house? Yeah, yeah. That's what, that weird? <laughs> because they're already planning for the big mega house they're going to put there. Because if you look at that lot, has the golf club on both sides of it. Yeah, there's a piece of the golf club that comes in. Uh, where is the that? Oh, I. there yeah see the golf club is on both sides it, those woods belong to the golf club so. yeah this is golf yeah golf club owned land and i i believe this was recently sold let me see if the information what's the size of the property again approximately what's that size of the piece of property um the size is a half an acre, six tenths of an acre. Looks larger than that. No, it doesn't show. Uh, oh, it was sold. Yeah, bought in 2022. Yeah. So um, that was just the starter house. That's uh, <laughs> the progress. Um, you know, I, I don't see any historic significance to it uh, other than uh, hopefully perhaps recommending that possibly the applicant seek to have the house moved elsewhere for... Uh, Is that the one that there were some beams um, off the kitchen someplace showing? I don't, one of the most no, I don't yeah, remember. In the some, application, yeah. the interior yeah. photos. Yeah, there's some in the ceiling of the kitchen. It could be fake. It looks small. Let's see if I can be. Well, I mean, you know, for the, the whole thing to end up in a dumpster, couldn't they donate some of it to Habitat for Humanity? Like the windows and some of the piping yeah. and... Whole house. Yeah, house. exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, right. they're not going to be able to move it back to there. <laughs> right. That's the kind of place here. Yes, there are beams on the or exposed beams, but uh, that might be faux. Could be. Because if they could adaptively reuse it since they're getting rid of all the accessory structures, then, mm. I mean, on the property, first of all, of course. So. Well, I'll say there's no objection, but perhaps some thought should be given to having the existing buildings. Uh, Reuse, reuse by, or by moving or whatever else uh, as a possibility. Yeah. You know, as long as 
There's no immediate pressure for timing cons new construction. Uh, you know, it might, it might be an op option for the individual. It's a shame it couldn't be sort of adaptively reused in, or incorporated into a new design where you'd have something very new that would still, you know, leave this. this yeah. Well, I, I suspect the interior is, it's, the interior is not historic in character right. either. Right. So it's, right. yeah, it, it's basically, you know, a, a fundamental problem here of having a, a good structure be demolished because it's too small for the market appetite mm -hmm. for buildings right. here. Mm -hmm. right. uh, that, that's one of the tragedies of this neighborhood we live in. Mm -hmm. right. So if there's, I'll, I will make a comment about attempted reuse uh, you know, either by uh, sale or movement. They have somebody maybe it's an existing resource and it just seems to throw it away when you I mean you, when you introduced it you mentioned several times that how well kept it was yeah I mean if there was ever a building that begged to be reused somewhere mm. or somehow mm. something that's that well kept yeah, yeah. yeah. I get that you know go to 361 Mitchell you know if it's deteriorated and it hasn't yeah. been kept I I have a would have a very difficult time telling them they need to, to upgrade that and adapt to really mm. reuse it. But you take something that's so well taken care of, it's... Yeah. And when the town has so many programs now trying to develop affordable housing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have right. this, this ADU a, stuff a that they're to, doing. To not to be able to reuse this. Maybe there's, there's uh, unit. Uh, the possibility of encouraging uh, the Southampton Housing Authority to... Yes. Maybe we could make refer a referral to, to the housing yeah. authority. To, to, yes, yeah. That should become a new option. Take yeah. it. Uh, referral take to the housing authority. Because this is structurally sound. Yeah. yeah. And it's certainly, you know, I think anyone would be happy to be able to move into that house. Mm. The question is, you know, among other things, moving it someplace. Yeah. 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 Yes, but there are funds. There yeah. are funds available. Okay. If there are funds to yeah. develop yeah. new, yeah. there are also funds to yeah. relocate. Yeah. Okay, so we'll recommend something and uh, Maybe send a note to Ken send, back. Send send a copy to the director of the Southampton Housing Authority. Yeah. It should be a, a standard practice with I something that's should. such a good resource. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 like, like we talk about the throwaway culture we live in, and it's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying because. I deal with real estate, and people want big, 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 but there's a lot of people who are just as thrilled to live in that mm -hmm. yeah, if they could live here. A conference with <laughs> Kara. So, okay, well, we did, did 361 Mitchell Lane. We did 3058 Noyak Road, and Susan and Vicki uh, looked at 142 Cobb Road. Right. Yes. Not sure if the applicant is... We do. Still online at all, or still online? And so I guess they should I, it's, it can, yeah. indicate that if they <laughs> want to participate. If not, they can listen. Um, Vicky and I um, went for a site visit on March 8th, and um, we were met by um, Tim Greening from the architect's firm, and it was. Um, Fortunately, a nice day. We have viewed only the exterior, but you know, prior to that, I wanted to say, reading the application, it, it was a very well put together and informative application to start with, with a lot of detail and diagrams. And the um, Tim Greening, who met with us, seemed to have a really good understanding of. Um, the different um, aspects. They had foiled all of the um, prior permits, and he seemed to be very familiar with those. In fact, he had the subdivision map of the larger property before I did, and was aware that there was a 1945 house um, down around the corner. So that having the application itself was very um, helpful when um, 
we arrived, we, I said, saw the exterior, and looking at that application, we can look you know, from there. The front volume, which is the west volume, appears to be the original. And I mean, in form, it's on a brick foundation. The AYB um, is 1930, however, with the brick foundation, Vicki and I thought it was more the early, it was 19, 1900s. Um, the yeah. rear are all additions between um, around 2000, 2003, and those are, that's where most of the, um, new, the new work is um, proposed for. But looking from the front, um, there's a small little section on the left, which is a one story. There is a small porch there, and they're proposing to remove that porch and then put in windows so there'll be more natural light. And also on the front, um, changing the solid uh, wood door to a, a wood door with glass windows so there'll be more light. But and uh, and the vintage of the original door is you know is is unknown. We just um, looked at it through the the storm door. But this house has been renovated a number of times, and to our knowledge, there the the six over one windows all match in the new section and, and the original section volume that all the windows that you see on the front part um, are replacements. So, you know, that being said, you know, we did, I'll go back to the history in just a minute. There, you can go up to that. We, um, and you can see in that 2002 tax photo that I included on the overview of construction, you can see it being built. So I, I love the ones when you can find that and see something in progress. So um, we had no objection to what we see being proposed because the one thing is to remove that section and they're going to enlarge it. There's going to be a, um, we can go to the application in a few minutes, a, a, a cross cable section. And then they had actually inquired um, the architect firm earlier about adding a one-story glass section to the rear. So if you would go to the application, I think you will, or you could scroll down through my overview also if you want. I guess it would be, you would find. You can scroll down through the overview. Okay, you're in the application. But um, they're going to add, and that's a one-story glass addition that will not be visible from Cobb Road. And right now it is heavily screened from Cobb Road, so it's really not um, entirely visible. And they're proposing to alter the driveway on the north and provide more screening on that side so it will be more screened from the northern property. It's um, listed in the AKRF table as um, needs further research because it couldn't be viewed from the road. So, so there's a picture, right? But it's excellent, to... excellent application to, to show what um, that, that they're proposing. Mm -hmm. You know, with the history, it goes back, it's a Burnett property. And um, Tim was uh, was aware of that. There was a, a Kay Jones. We actually did the Jones property, 593 Flying Point. It's gone. And there's a larger house there. But the Jones family, a member of that family, actually provided the CEO um, affidavit in 2000 and said that the family had lived there to about that time. And looking back at the maps, it belonged um, 1858 to to the Stephen Burnett. It's the same family, but at Matthias, they split out. Luther D's are down there on the Flying Point area when one and some of David's, 
but Stevens were up um, in this area of Cobb Road, and it would have gone to his son, Jollop, who went by J. Period Allen or Allen Burnett. So if you look at the 1873 uh, through 1894 maps, we have J. Allen um, on it. And there was a family homestead there in 1858. Our feeling was that is not extent. Um, also in um, 1873, I need to add to my history that um, J. Allen built a boarding house it was 28 feet by 55 feet, and I assume that was three stories, which would have been quite large mm -hmm. on this particular property. And my guess that was closer down to the junction with Cobb Road West, because this particular property had a little small subdivision for um, Alan's sister Elizabeth. And I think she either lived in the homestead or would have lived in the um, boarding house because she was a school teacher in Watermill, um, West Hampton Beach, and Calverton. And the different articles said she either rented her apartment or she came home for the summer to her home in Watermill. But those, my guess, are not extent. But that's part of the history of um, this property. Mm -hmm. um, in it would have been um, Steve Allen's granddaughter Maud Bennett, excuse me, Maud Burnett Downs inherited it at some point, and it's from the Downs family that donated the land for the large park on Flying Point. My guess by the time she. Um, received um, the property, she sold it. So it was sold in 1966 to a Marianne Bolton, who um, proceeded, actually David was involved in some of those subdivision processes. It was this, it was a two lot subdivision in 1986, um, but actually there was a 21 acre property to the rear and if you scroll down, I guess I put the, the subdivision maps in the report. A 21 um, acre property to the rear and some properties um, up toward the front. It's, it's in the history section. But the larger um, properties on the, the road were eventually subdivided into smaller plots and Marianne seemed to be buying and selling other properties in the Flying Point area, um, along with doing this when her married name was Polkak, P-O-L-A-C-E-K, but she went back to her um, maiden name. Um, trying to think, after the, um, the property um, was sold, Marianne lived in this house from where I, she seemed to be doing 25 years or so of her real estate dealings. Um, so there, there's some history, but when it comes to landmarking, we would actually need, would need to do for, if someone was at all interested in possibly landmarking the property, it might be questionable doing to the amount of alterations mm -hmm. it's already, there already have occurred, but we would have to do further research to see if there's any of the original structures left. Yeah. So um, at this point, do, do you have anything to do, add? Do, no, the architect do, okay. is, is actually on yeah. the, if you'd like to, if you'd like to say something. Hi, good uh, evening. Good Hi. evening. Yeah. Thank you, Susan, good to see you again. Um, thank you for the comments on, on the application. It's great to hear, and glad we uh, provide you with enough information. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm mostly here just to answer any questions, but um, also just kind of want to clarify, I know we left off on site um, with mention of some of the potential for existing windows, whether they're 1950s or the 1930s, um, and anything that was found that's, you know, predates, say, the 1960s renovations there. Um, the question being, if we do find that 
what is the recommendation and um, how we proceed? And then is there any, uh, I guess, sway that you have with the building department in terms of uh, code issues for one, egress, and two, um, energy code uh, issues? Well, I would, uh, the only point at which we have ever had a difference with the building department uh, was involved with a designated landmark building that was under renovation, uh, where uh, originally the building department wanted to enlarge uh, certain windows of the structure uh, a historic structure which is also on the National Historic Register and eventually uh, uh, they, they agreed not to provide that kind of uh, code requirement for uh, for the renovation that took place. Okay. But in, in the absence of any real s historic uh, recognition of the property, you know, it would not be something I think we would get involved with. Right. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that, you know, just going forward. But um, yeah, absolutely. And, and as Susan mentioned, you know, what the application entails is maintaining um, that westernmost existing gable structure that was the 1930 structure. And we're, we're trying to be uh, extremely sensitive with regard to the existing materials and existing sizes of, of openings. Um, and fenestration and trim. Um, now again, there there is a component of the renovation of previous additions that have occurred from 1960s all the way through to 2000 um, for the eastern portion of what's the, the current uh, principal structure. And then the addition of, of the, the glass structure that will house the dining and uh, kitchen space. Uh, again, as Susan mentioned, um, thank you, uh, for, you know, reasons of mitigating impact up from the right of way, the public right of way, we'll be shifting or proposing to shift the, the driveway, um, create a better entry point one for the, for the clients, but also, as I mentioned, to mitigate some of the view um, that you can see of the, the renovation. Um, but again, we're really trying to maintain the character um, as much as possible of the principal structure and anything that's the two-story structure, uh, maintain it as true to you know existing and historic structure as possible, um, or traditional, I should say. So uh, that's really the uh, the main point of my you know comments. Um, and again, I'll, I'm here to answer any questions that you have on the application and clarify any items if, if required. Yeah. Well, one uh, comment I have is uh, thank you for the excellent product you presented uh, in the application. Uh, it uh, makes for uh, at least a feeling among the board members that you're paying attention to uh, the object that uh, you're working with and of what remains of its historic uh, character. And my uh, other comment is uh, to uh, say sorry that you're not in the Bridgehampton Historic District. <laughs> maybe we'll get you there one day. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh. Make it, make it tough. Okay. Uh, anyway, any further uh, questions for him? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So, um, did you have anything? Did I? No, I thought it was a very good, um, well thought out um, proposed renovation and addition. Um, really, these, he's, I think, going out of his way to try and preserve the original, what's left of the original structure. Everything else, all those little add-ons, they're, they're, it's a good thing they're going away. I think it'll enhance the uh, appearance. Mm. And um, 
as the architect said, you won't see most of it from the street anyway in terms of the glass addition, which I think is a very good solution mm -hmm. to what the family needs in terms of expansion and not trying to replicate something or make it look, you know, mm -hmm. old when in fact it's not. It has a contemporary, it is contemporary for contemporary needs. Right. Right? Consistent yeah. with Secretary yeah. of Interior standards. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Exactly. So I'm very much in favor of it. Okay. Uh, Susan, would you, do you want to yeah, do the response? Exactly. And I would say, you know, of course, no objection, but just, re, you know, recommend adaptive reuse of materials if, if that door is original, if they find anything, right. uh, or, or donate. So that would be my recommendation. Right. But also, just make a comment about uh, the excellent, excellent presentation. Yes, I will do that. <laughs> I will make sure that I make note of that because it really, it really was outstanding. So, okay. Well, thank you. Thank All right. you very much. Right. Good night. Have a good night. Good night. Uh, we can then proceed to uh, the uh, issue of the construction at 61 Halsey Lane. Uh, was for an inconsequential uh, garage apartment uh, renovation that uh, it was determined was not it did not need full assessment. I think it was built in 2000. Yeah. I mean it was built <laughs> around 2000. So it, no. amongst other it plus the work was already done. All right. Okay. Uh, certificate of appropriateness 2385. Uh, we all. Uh, recall this, I believe, from uh, last uh, meeting. And uh, we received updated uh, details of the sign. It's to be shrunken down to the 21 square foot normative uh, in the code uh, facade sign for the building, whereas it was about 24 or 5 feet square feet uh, in the original proposal. Um, the alignment is supposed to be redone. Let's see, this is the uh, simulation that was uh, redone uh, to show it moved away from the adjoining building uh, and centered over the entry door and uh, first floor window of this particular store unit uh, there. Uh, this uh, design has a little bit of a different feel to it because it's the window alignments aren't perfect in the building with the uh, uh, door as well. Uh, I did prepare a resolution for that. I, did you all get the resolution? And yes. let me see if I can. Uh, find the uh, find the resolution in the sets of files I have here oh dear 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 Ah, yes, okay. So, we had, um, Got to 
overly sensitive <laughs> touchpad here. Uh, so let me uh, read the resolution for 2385. Uh, Whereas Landmarks and Historic Districts Board received an application dated January 30th, 2024, for a required certificate of appropriateness for a change in the exterior appearance with a new sign at 2385 Montauk Highway, Bridgehampton, a non-contributing resource of the Bull's Head and Main Street Historic District. And whereas the uh, Landmarks and Historic Districts Board reviewed the plans for the new signage, containing the text Edward Jones Investments on the facade of the commercial structure at 2385 Montauk Highway at its February 20th, 24 meeting. And whereas subsequent revisions proposed by the applicant under the design of architectural design of Yapank, New York, dated February 26, 2024, for building department review, provide for a sign, one with text in white with mixed typefaces of Edward Jones Investments on black background, two, that is unlit, three, reduced in size to three foot by seven foot, and four, with alignment centered over the reference span of the entry door and ground floor window of the store, resolved the Landmarks and Historic Districts Board finds the application for the sign as revised suitable for installation at 2385 Montauk Highway, Bridgehampton, is consistent with the historic character of the district and approves the issuance of a COA for s the sign features identified above. Does that contain mm -hmm. yeah, so. what we want? Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion for it? Motion. Motion by Vicki. Uh, second. Second. Second by Stephanie. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Is uh, Martha still online? Don't think so. Was she able to catch? <coughs> I hear nothing, so uh, we will uh, list her as an abstention. She's not on the Zoom anymore. Okay. Uh, we'll list her as absent. Uh, all right, so that's uh, done. Uh, we also have a leftover from our last meeting with respect to 97 School Street and uh, got a request for uh, an expedited approval from land management. Uh, with, uh, there was a sense that there would have been an earlier, I guess, certificate of appropriateness application, but it <clears throat> came on March 8th. Uh, and <clears throat> this is a resolution to record the approval process that we followed, in which members uh, provided uh, approval by uh, email. Um, Whereas the Landmarks and Historic Districts Board reviewed the plans for proposed installation of solar generating panels on the roof of the commercial <coughs> structure at 97 School Street at its February 20, 20, 20, February 20, <laughs> 2024 meeting as a result of a referral from the Planning Board, and whereas a request from Land Management was made for expediting review for an application dated March 8, 2024 for a required certificate of appropriateness based upon the February 2024 20, review <laughs> by the <laughs> Landmarks and Historic Districts Board. And whereas uh, Landmarks and Historic District Board members Davis, Hine, Roberts, Gibbons, Gennettis, Wisnowski gave expedited approval by email for the issuance of the certificate of appropriateness the installation of the solar generating panels at 97 School Street, Bridgehampton, now th therefore be it resolved. This resolution of rec record acknowledges uh, the Landmarks Board action for said COA and is to be entered into the minutes of the March 19, 2024 LHDB meeting. And uh, I would move its adoption. Uh, 
Second. And we have it second from uh, Tim. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, motion carried. Resolution carried. Uh, we've finished with uh, 2330. Oh. Well, at some point, were we going to discuss the process? or that's That working? stuff is in works. Uh, right. They're okay. kind of working through an administrative. Yep, we'll be preparing some uh, okay. procedures. I mean, and just, just for the record, I agreed with your comments. So. Somebody's calling on the telephone. Yeah. <laughs> Say nobody's home. Wants to get in the front door. What's that? Just answer. Uh -oh. Hello? Yes, we are. Yes. Hi, David. Uh-huh. Deal or no deal, it's everyone. <laughs> when the banker calls. <laughs> well, not at this point in time. I think at the time, a uh, certificate of appropriateness is filed. Uh, okay, yes, that's. Okay. All right, good. I have to get back to my meeting here. <laughs> right. Uh, David Gilmartin. <laughs> he found more pictures, so. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> we have a referral from the planning board of uh, the proposal for the Atlantic, um, um, for the Atlantic Golf Course housing, uh, mm -hmm. and I just probably. I don't know how much uh, awareness people have. It's not something that I know a lot of people would, you know, uh, frequently travel by. Um, but there is a couple things to, uh, I think, note about it. One, this was previously referred to us, um, and we sent back a commentary that the plans seem to not take into account the uh, view of Shorts Pond, which is uh, north of Scuttle, on the north side of Scuttlehole Road. And <coughs> uh, eventually, the planning board, I, I guess, uh, required an easement to provide for a view shed. I don't know if that. I thought it was outlined in yellow here on one of the pages. Let's see if I can bring it up. Yes, there it is. It's very hard to identify the uh, area, but uh, this is the south boundary of the view shed. This is Scuttlehole Road down here, and this is the uh, north boundary of the view shed, and this is about where the pond is. And the easement requires them to mow and keep it basically clear landscape for uh, the historic view of the pond. Uh, so I found this very encouraging yeah, that yeah, yeah, we're protecting good. views and people are taking our arguments about protecting historic views uh, seriously and uh, 
uh, my un uh, only little aggravation is not with the property of the Atlantic Golf, uh, Golf Club, but rather the uh, town of Southampton. On Scuttlehoe Road, there's about 50 feet of scrubby uh, brush and trees that line the road that also kind of block the view uh, just to, you can't see it on this, but maybe, uh, maybe it's on this one here. Yeah, as you go further down Scuttlehoe Road here, uh, you get kind of a block view that comes from the town right away that uh, could be cleaned up if somebody uh, wanted to do it. But uh, maybe that's something to think about down the road. But I think we've got everything that uh, is important here. And I didn't get a chance, of course, to drive up there. Does that mean, is there a potato barn that's going to be lost in this, that one that's... No. No, oh, okay. There is a potato barn right okay. on the road yeah. there that yeah. uh, used to belong to uh, the farm, uh, which was the Sarah Baldwin farm for many years, okay. uh, and that they use for storage of their landscaping equipment and other... Uh, so how, where is this in relation to that? <laughs> this is east on an open parcel. Uh, let me see if I can bring it up on the overhead the here. Uh, <clears throat> 1040 Scuttlehole. Okay, so this is Scuttlehole Road. Let me bring this up a little bit. This is Shorts Pond. This is heading east on Scuttlehole Road. And this is the parcel where the housing would be situated. Where was it proposed before? It was proposed closer to the pond, or is this the same? Uh, I, th I think it was a little bit forward. I didn't compare it with the, uh, uh, with the original uh, there. But this is the area where, you know, on the town right of way I was talking about right here, yeah. that would give you an extra two-second flash of Short's Pond as you're driving by. You know. uh, but in any case, they, when they put the building here, they will have to keep this area clear so that people driving and by. The other aspect of this is that there is a trail that will go from Scuttlehole Road here, wind its way around the pond and go through the golf course property that uh, there will be public access for. Um, So uh, my sense is compliment them for the easement on the view shed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we look forward to hearing about more possibilities like that. Uh, okay. Uh, Stony Brook Southampton Windmill is a project that uh, started up after our last meeting, I think. And Vicki, would you want to? Uh, no, I, I'll, uh, I'll <laughs> defer to you. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, anyway, there's a, a project in which the um, thought is that a possible landmark designation of the windmill would provide the opportunity for the use of community preservation funds for restoration of the windmill. Mm -hmm. uh, if 
the State University of New York's uh, Stony Brook administration would be interested in doing such thing. Uh, Assemblyman Fred Thiel has been trying to get legislative approval of such a process. I don't know where that stands, uh, but the thought is that uh, when Stony Brook, a Citizens Advisory Council for Stony Brook meets in May at the Southampton campus that this may be in hand and it may be discussed as an open possibility and path for preservation of, uh, of the windmill. Uh, so uh, some preparation of the background on the windmill that would serve as the basis for recommendation to the town board for possible designation should this plan make progress uh, was to be prepared and uh, Martha and, and Vicki kind of have kind of agreed to kind of shepherd it a little bit along the way as this evolves so uh, uh, and Julie Green is going to work on this as a possibility too. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. Um, <clears throat> we had a discussion on 126 South Country Road uh, just before the meeting. There were some further details that needed to be kind of uh, looked at for this recommendation for landmark designation that we would send to the town board, uh, just trying to isolate the uh, particular individuals associated with the property among the vast number of uh, members of the Tuthill family that have been uh, populating the whole area of Spionk and Remsenburg for generations. Uh, and so uh, that will, uh, It'll be a process to uh, sort through too going down the road, uh, but it is actively uh, underway. Uh, 11 uh, Walnut Avenue and 149 South Country Road. I think they're just uh, continuing waiting for. Yeah, actually, 149 South Country Road, um, an easement offer has been made. Um, the owner is uh, working with his attorney to flesh out the details of that and get that uh, ironed out and uh, so that that is proceeding oh. I haven't heard anything from the owner of 11 Walnut okay well that's good to hear that uh, yes that progress is being made mm -hmm. uh, which uh, connects us to uh, a possibility of next month's meeting of having Jacqueline Fenlon from the Community Preservation Department uh, come to chat with us about the process of historic easement uh, associated with the, our landmarking activity. Uh, she would like to do, because it involves the potential of talking about different projects that are particularly uh, significant and involved negotiations and so on. Uh, she asked that it be in an executive session, mm -hmm. which uh, I would propose that uh, our meeting agenda be exe executive session from 7 p.m. to 7.30, and that our open regular business be from 7.30 on so that we can if that is, sounds okay with everybody? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so that's um, one way of trying to manage the uh, business. Ed, would that be the appropriate time? I know there's some, some changes with the Dick's windmill, but maybe wait till next month. It's not pressing what's going on with that in CPF. I think it's... Yeah, well, I don't know what the... Uh, I, I know that there was some transfer of <laughs> ownership interests yes, involved. Right. I read it, but I wouldn't try to even explain it verbally because I'm not sure the details. Okay. Maybe we can yeah. find out next month. Oh, okay. 
Um, let's see, uh, we have, oh, the Landmarks Maintenance Program. Uh, thanks to Vicki, we got something, uh, a press release, a press release uh, yes. done, an announcement Thanks made. To <laughs> yeah, and uh, did we get... Uh, I haven't heard anything. You haven't received any feedback or anything like that? Okay. Not a single call. I think, uh, was it the end of March that, yes. that a deadline was for? So mm -hmm. uh, for eligible... We've got a couple of weeks. So. Yeah, uh, uh, eligible, but they have to get their application and their act right. together. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and thanks for getting it through the mm -hmm. upper levels of the town bureaucracy. So, uh, they're very helpful. Oh, good. good. Um, let's see. I don't have any thing else. Does anybody? Have any other issues? I just issues? have a quick, I'm just throwing this out. Um, I do those lists every year. I was wondering if anybody wanted to volunteer, in a sense, maybe to take over the referrals and the COs. I can see that list. Right now, I'm about at my limit. And before the referrals, there were a couple from the planning board, a couple COs a year. And now we're having two to three for meeting, so that's, if somebody just wants to keep a running list of what referrals we you mean, are you, reviewing you, and you, what COs. You're talking about the out. function of monitoring the business before the ZBA and the planning board that might be associated with uh, uh, historic properties. Right, whatever we receive. Yeah. I just made a list of what we received and what we reviewed uh -huh. and a possible out it got two or three word outcome it's the list that i sent out at for 2023 not that it needs to be done the way i did it but i can just see that it's a whole separate thing from the construction and the demolition but it's very positive yeah work for the board very maybe when the agenda is being made there's a separate document that you're mm -hmm. just copying planning board or zoning board referrals yeah i can keep as, as, right like so there may be a way total. just mm -hmm. to right so there may be a way just to generate a list yeah. it would, the time to generate it would be the time the agendas are are made so i mean i go back if i don't get it done month by month which i don't always get it done the month i go back and i look at the agendas mm -hmm. and i look at the minutes and between those two you because every now and again the agendas are 99 percent accurate but there might be so if you double check with the minutes you'd see if something got added so so you're looking for the referrals and the coas to be covered. yeah so it'd be yeah, whatever Just those two I'll see what I can do. Should be relatively. Wow, thank you. I mean, once the agenda is so done, it's that just one copy separate and section yeah. that I did. So great, right. just copy thank and you. pasting. Mm -hmm. so, anybody else with any? Do you have anything to throw onto the table here? Won't be here next month. Okay. Um, so if there is nothing else, let's see, I, one other possible piece of business is that uh, there are, uh, there is an interest in uh, getting a designation for uh, a house on Major's Path that uh, is built 1883 and uh, is in dire need of attention and the owner is interested in getting uh, p the possibility of designation in order to receive a historic easement uh, in order to restore uh, the property and uh, uh, that discussion will uh, probably go on for uh, if, a couple um, of weeks. whoever's writing the history, I may have some research on that. I think I may have done that 
for somebody, the one up near the Writing Academy. Right, yes, that's so, uh, that's the property the associated with it, yes. 259, no, I'm not sure. 259. I, is it? It is, yes, it is. How do I remember that? <laughs> but anyways, I think I have some, somebody that asked me a question about it. So I'll, I'll send that on to you right now and... Okay, um, that's fine. Actually, I uh, was the, the, the person who owns the, owns it uh, is not living there at the moment, but uh, is uh, has a good grasp of the architectural character inside. Uh, he was originally under the impression that the house was built uh, in the 1860s, but there were certain anomalies in the right. materials and construction that I didn't haven't add seen up. it yeah. except from the road yeah but um, yeah. it's more so, the maps and the owners right. versus South well I'm going I, I've traced the ownership back uh, from about 1750 up to oh well, then you're uh, farther probably nine, long 1900 I'll send so. you what I have anyway and you can use it or not. yeah okay uh, anyway, uh, th th that's just an uh, alert. Uh, that's something associated with that property on Major's uh, path will be coming down. Is it, it's near the beginning, near the village, close to the village. It's not too far up, yeah. yeah. It's not too far. It's near the riding, the yeah, old academy, right, the high, stables. The right it's, side. Go it's before it, though, like if you were coming up. <coughs> yeah. It's, it faces south. It faces south. It faces yeah. south. It yes. doesn't face the road. Right. Yes. What is the story with that house? It's always, it <coughs> always looked like it was on the verge of falling in. And it, like it, well, it uh, was neglected for a period of time. There was complicated elements of the family ownership issues right. that were involved in it, and uh, uh, those complications appear to be settled Settle. and so Good. the owner in charge uh, is interested in uh, restoring the house uh, and it, it does look very uh, I, impressive. I would have never guessed 18, 1883 for that house either. Yeah. What would you have thought? Or I would have thought more older. Older? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, the, 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 the house was built by uh, a New York City contractor who provided the stones for the uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Mm -hmm. yeah, his name was Babcock. And uh, he built the house and died a year later. Oh. Uh, so, But there was an earlier farmhouse there of a number of farmers that uh, existed uh, uh, one was from uh, the North Fork, uh, uh, I forget Benjamin something, but uh, before that there was a, uh, an owner named uh, uh, Hewlett Reeves who had that as an earlier farm and he got it from a Jagger and a Jagger got it from a Foster. <laughs> so, you. yeah, you're going back <laughs> to the early land grant uh, episodes of uh, that piece of property up there. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's it's still to be detailed and fleshed out with uh, more information. Uh, anything further? If not, this meeting is adjourned. And thank you. Thank you.